This is a special one that uh, I wanted to put together with my good friend Brian Dovey. And we thought we would do this in the form of a fireside chat. To get underway, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you a little story. Do I, do I have, um, how many people out there have been around the entrepreneurship field for 20 years, 25 years? All right, a couple of people. Uh, might you know the name Jeff Timmons? Would that name ring a bell to you? Okay, um, for those of you that, that wouldn't know that name, um, um, in his time, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education and the programs that we have today would not, would, would not have this blossoming if it wasn't for the seeds that Jeff Timmons planted. Jeff is a, uh, was a professor at uh, Babson College and was a, a classmate of Brian Dovey's here at Harvard University. And around that time, we were, we were very fortunate because we had our own version in San Diego of a Jeff Timmons. We had a guy named Darl Mitten. And Darl was, um, was a fireball, and he was doing entrepreneurship education on our campus uh, when people had no idea what he was doing, and um, he bore a lot of slings and arrows um, uh, because people never envisioned entrepreneurship as a legitimate discipline at the time. And those of you in the audience um, uh, who've been around for a while understand that. And so the field of entrepreneurship really began to emerge. Um, uh, with the Babson C Conference, Symposium for Entrepreneurship Educators. Um, uh, USASB was just beginning to emerge as a professional organization. Uh, ICSB um, had been around for a while, but um, again, beginning these trends to give legitimacy to the field of entrepreneurship. And, we started developing new courses and so forth. So um, with those kind of early beginnings, uh, we started building out our program here at San Diego State. Uh, it started with one course in entrepreneurship where we did everything in one 15-week course. And then it turned into two, and then it turned into four, and we started, we started subdividing it into different areas so that we had the seedlings for a curriculum in entrepreneurship. And we were pretty proud of that curriculum and, and how we were able to put something together where it didn't really exist before, uh, at least on our campus. And one day I'm sitting in my office and I, I get a call from Jeff Timmons. Jeff Timmons calling me? I mean, uh, you get a call from Jeff Timmons, you take that call. Um, I, was, I was an assistant professor at the time. And uh, he said, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. He said, we were classmates in Harvard. He is a, uh, he's a VC investor. They specialize in life science and biotech. And I'm kind of saying, you want me to meet one of your friends? And uh, he put a little bug in my ear. He said, I think he might like to do some teaching. And by the way, he spends his winters in San Diego. I said, oh. So I was armed with, uh, I was armed with a little, little bit of background knowledge here. And into our center walks Brian Dovey. And uh, so I've got this, this esteemed gentleman over here. He's walking in. and. I'm getting prepped and I had all of our stuff out and I wanted to show him everything we were doing in entrepreneurship education. And he looked at it and, you know, he nodded and, you know, he's smiling about it and I'm feeling good. Brian's, I'm impressing Brian Dovey. <laughs> but he looked at, he looked at 
our collection of courses. He said, Alex, this is wonderful. These courses are really fantastic. He says, but everything that you're doing in these courses, opportunity analysis, trend spotting, business plan development, um, uh, seed funding, uh, everything you're doing is preparing students for day one. He says, what are you teaching them about running a company after day one? And it was at that point, I looked at our curriculum, and for about 20 seconds, I was a deer in headlights. And then I looked at Brian and I said, that's the course you and I are going to create. And we decided to call it Managing the Growing Entrepreneurial Firm. And so in our first meeting, we agreed that we would try to create a course and that we would co-teach it together. So he said, how are we going to teach a course on managing a growing firm? We didn't, have any, we didn't have many models out there. I had one model from Babson. Uh, do you remember Ed Marum? Yeah. Yeah, Ed Marum had a course, and he sent me a syllabus. And uh, um, so we started from there. So Brian and I went home. We agreed to meet about a week or so later. And I would make a list and he would make a list of anything and everything that we could talk about that related to managing a growing firm. Try it sometime, try to make that list and see what it would be. And so we came back and he had a list a mile long and I had another list a mile long and we only had a 15 week semester. And, um, so we massaged, we tried to group topics and uh, do a lot of um, puzzle fitting, if you will. And that led to the creation and the first iteration of our, of our, course, of our course called Managing the Growing Firm. And um, so I was the instructor of record and Brian, did we ever pay you for that course? <laughs> uh, I, 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 you, you, you doubled it about halfway through, so it's still zero. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Don't give him any ideas. <laughs> but um, uh, so all of us bring guest speakers into our class, and um, you know, you bring in fabulous entrepreneurs and they come in, they tell their stories, the students are in awe, and they say, wow, I got a chance to meet so-and-so, and we do that too. But in this case, um, uh, Brian agreed to come in for, about, for a series of about six, about half the course, and, and we would start iterating and teaching it. And um, in a couple of weeks, our semester ends, and we'll and it will have we will have completed 25 years of teaching together uh, in this course, and uh, having the privilege to um, co-teach with uh, Brian Dovey, I've learned so much, and um, I think our students have learned so much from that part of the process. I thought it would be fun for us to have this sort of a fireside chat. So that's kind of my perspective, Brian. Uh, where do you go? I mean, where, what's your take on all of this? Just by way of quick background, when, when Jeff and I were at Harvard together, there was only one course in entrepreneurship. It was called Management of New Enterprises. And the, all the other professors hated it. They absolutely hated it. They just didn't think it was appropriate. I remember one prof standing up and saying that, um, you're here to run Fortune 500 companies, you're not here to run a dry cleaning business. So and then that was it. The word entrepreneur had a very negative connotation to it. Um, so that was one of the things I, when I got out, I swore I'd never be an entrepreneur. That sounded like an awful thing, you know. <laughs> and of course, it's the first thing I did. Um, and then I ran a large company, and then I went on to become a venture capitalist. So uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see the transition in a relatively short period of time. Um, that entrepreneurship and the attention that it's getting 
and it, than it deserves to. Um, the one, the one good thing I think about, or the number of good things that we did, um, is the one-off speaker doesn't necessarily fit in with what it is you're, you're necessarily trying to teach. So the way Alex and I configured the program, he talked about you know, areas that were going to be important to entrepreneurship. So let's say management. And then I had a couple cases um, where management was the major issue. And these are not um, cases that were fictitious or cases that we made up. These are actually deals that we did. I think the, the second most important thing by, by dint of having a number of um, sessions together is spending time on your failures. Most one-off speakers will get up there and talk about you know, how they turn this around, how great things are. But from the student's perspective, they learn much more about how you screwed up um, than by you know, what your successes are. So we have the opportunity to talk about you know, how we made some big mistakes um, in, uh, um, and the consequences of that. Um, so I think that, that's been the hallmark of this the 25 wow. years. And uh, we were able to do some very, very creative things. Um, I think probably the most boring thing in the whole world are our partner meetings. But we had a partner meeting in front of the whole class. They thought it was terrific. <laughs> yelling at each other and talking and having a, um, um, a great, great time. Um, we had a real, a real one. Oh, they, they, were, they were live. There was a live partner meeting. Yeah. Live partner meeting. Which was very difficult because, you know, we, we, put, we had a junior person put great effort into disguising the names of the companies. And my partners, within about five minutes, were using the real name and screaming <laughs> at each other. <laughs> it really didn't do any good. No, it was a real live partner meeting. Um, and then at the end, I would describe, to some extent, it was, some of the stuff was fairly esoteric, exactly what we were talking about in the financing, et cetera. So, um, you know, I mean, uh, it's just uh, a point on how that came about, because uh, I'll never forget it. Um, um, yes. Babson used to run the, and I, I think they still do. Anybody attend the Babson C conferences, the Symposium for Entrepreneurship Educators? Um, used to be that, I know Clint, you've been to one before, that's great. Um, used to be where in order for you to go to the C conference, you had to be a faculty member and you had to bring an entrepreneur with you who was interested in teaching. So Brian and I were just getting underway. And so, you know, it was a conference kind of like this, about a hundred or hundred and some odd people. And, you know, they were telling us all the wonderful things they were doing around entrepreneurship education at Babson. It's very impressive uh, what they do. And um, I remember at one point we were in this, um, this, this big lecture hall and I happened to be on one side of the lecture hall and Brian's on the other side, it was crowded and uh, the Babson people were talking to us about you know, some of the unique innovative activities that they do and one of them was, well in our program we let our students sit in and watch a live venture capital meeting take place right, right in front of the class and then we debrief it and everyone's saying, wow, you did that? And I'm on one side of the room, Brian's way on the other side, we lock eyes, and I remember, Brian, you gave me a thumbs up. Um, and within a few weeks coming out of that program, uh, we arranged a partner meeting, uh, and we did that for quite a number of years. Yes. And the whole idea, why would we do that? Is it show, so forth? We were talking about managing a growing firm. And we were talking about value drivers and what, what does a company have to do? Brian would do lectures on what's called the next, what you would refer to as the next fundable milestone. 
And so we would talk about how do you drive value in a business? What does a company have to do to get to the next fundable milestone? And as we were talking about those issues, then we had a chance to, to watch the partner meeting. They gave us summaries, disguised summaries, of uh, just summaries of the, the companies and what the issues were. And so as we watched the partner meeting, they were talking about each of these companies and that was fascinating for the students. It was like being in a fishbowl in a sense and watching this thing. But where the real learning took place was after the meeting ended and it was these people were moving millions of dollars around to different companies in terms of their, of their funding decisions that were happening right in front of us. But the real learning took place is after the meeting, they closed the meeting out and they all turned around and then we took Q&A from the, from the students in terms of what was your thinking behind making that kind of a decision and so forth. And that was where the real value uh, came in on something like that. And, you know, so uh, why are we telling you this story? I mean, these stories, and Brian will give us some other examples of some of the unique things we did. Uh, well, two reasons. Number one, um, this is, um, you know, I'm not going to be teaching that class anymore, and uh, we've had a 25-year run. Uh, so we wanted to celebrate a little bit with all of you. But more importantly, um, there are other Brian Dovies out there that are in your communities. And there are people like that that have an interest in, in teaching. Now, you can give them a syllabus and throw them in front of a class and say, go ahead and go teach this course. Or you can do it in a really meaningful way of uh, co-teaching a course. And that's, that's, that's what we wanted to share with you a little bit about today. So Brian, your take on our, the dynamics and what were some of the things that you were able to bring to the class? Well, I think, you know, we talk a lot about pivoting and changing, et cetera, and actually having live cases um, where, um, where there's a lot of that going on. Probably the richest case is um, one of the er er very early deals that I did, um, a line which is Invisalign, invisible braces, um, and it's a it's a great story. Um, first of all, the two entrepreneurs had no background or experience. Uh, they had just graduated um, from school, one in the environmental studies and the and the other in. Um, history, I think, and um, real smart, um, and kind of came up with this idea of using a system of aligners, uh, of braces, to, to make braces. The intellectual property was probably the best I've ever seen. They had um, patented uh, the idea of using three or more of these aligners um, to straighten teeth, um, and independent of what the material was or anything else, they had the patent on it. It was a very strong patent. They were also extremely committed to the to the procedure and the process. Um, but kind of venture capital 101 says never invest in somebody like that. Even even worse is the two of them were living together, and who knows how that was going to happen. So uh, a lot of these uh, issues we throw right back at the right. class. Right. Um, and okay, should we just forget about the, the uh, idea that they have a relationship together or should I discuss it with them? And then there are those that say, don't say anything. And those that say, well, let's, yes, you, you gotta cover it with them. And I will role play then and, and uh, ask them, I pretend that they're they're me, uh, and I'm the uh, entrepreneur, um, which is a lot of, which is great. So there's a lot of back and forth, and they're involved in it. The 
time that we did um, the company was um, in the height of, um, of the internet. And in order to execute, um, it required a lot of programming. And programmers were just not available. Um, so we were trying to do it, you know, in Northern California, the, the um, IT people were like 80, 90,000 a year. So we moved the entire operation over to Pakistan. Um, and the lesson I was, we were trying to teach them is that sometimes what looks like a heroic move really isn't. It's the most conservative. The, the example I give is um, everybody considers aspirin a very conservative medicine, but it would be a fairly radical thing to do if you had cancer. So you need to do something a lot more, a, a lot differently. Um, that, was, that was quite an effort, uh, putting everybody over there um, and getting a whole Pakistani group to, to, uh, um, to execute on it. And then, of course, came 9-11, and Pakistan became completely unacceptable. We had to move that entire operation of about 400 people almost overnight. Um, so we had to do some, some unique things. But we uh, used the class to, mm -hmm. and, and uh, split it um, to analyze also what, what we should, what, what the real opportunity was, what the strategy should be and uh, had them do due diligence. Right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, when I see a rich case like that and I've got someone who can give us, uh, if you, anybody remember Paul Harvey, if anybody could uh, give us the rest of the story, having someone like this as we're going through a case now, not many of our students are going to move an operation over to Pakistan, okay? But it was the underlying thinking that we're able to tease out. And we looked at manufacturing issues. We looked at cost-related issues. We looked at um, uh, consumer acceptance issues. We looked at professional. So what we did is we broke that out into so many different teaching areas, and then we started linking it back to value drivers in an organization. And so, so from there, that, those examples where Brian was able to give us the thinking beyond just a case, but having the rest of the story was, was instrumental because then it would be my job to work with the students because they were all working on local companies and trying to analyze managing a growing firm. But, you know, I mean, at a much smaller scale. And so what we had to do is I had to make sure that the students understood the underlying thinking behind it so that we can then apply how might, or might we could pose how might this apply in your particular situation, uh, with the client, with the actual clients, they're studying as part of our course in managing a growing firm. So that part was really, really instrumental. And it included changing out the uh, the founder to a professional manager, which was very difficult. But it was part of the um, part of a, a second section where you know Alex described. The, the issues associated with founders and should there be a transition over to and when to make that transition. Uh, and this was a very good example of, uh, uh, of that. And there are a number of them um, that we use cases for. Mm -hmm. So it kind of came up. Do we tell that I'm 57 years old and I played trumpet professionally when I was a young guy, so I never got my teeth fixed. I got a visible in right now. Right now? <laughs> my uh, <laughs> the ability to have straight teeth as an old guy. There you go. Um, 
You know, I mean, and, and it, but it's examples like that. I mean, um, this man is very modest, but uh, you know the value of defibrillators out there and the EpiPen, okay? He saw those as early concepts and uh, the kind of work that you've done, Brian, to bring amazing technologies to market uh, because of uh, your ability to kind of work with young companies through the challenges of managing a growing firm to bring technologies like that to the marketplace. Um, my initial start was with a doctor uh, and the two of us together started up a company and invented the EpiPen, um, which was uh, the third try at uh, a couple failures prior to that, but uh, it was, mm. uh, turned out to be a great success. So I want to segue for a few minutes, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, but Brian, you've got a book coming out. Uh, Brian posed an idea for a book to me, um, and he calls it The Idea is the Easy Part. And that is so germane to what we're talking about in our course, and it goes back to that fundamental observation that Brian made when he looked at our curriculum back in the day and he said, what are you teaching them beyond the idea and evaluating the idea, bringing it to market? Um, um, what made you want, want to write that book? Uh, the idea is the easy part. Uh, <laughs> I saved and I, I commute to Princeton from where I live near Philadelphia, which is about an hour. And when the um, pandemic hit, I found myself with two extra hours a day. <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and I wanted to do something really about uh, taking the, the course that Alex and I had been working on and uh, had been approached to put it online uh, and develop a system of courses about entrepreneurship, about you know uh, the growing firm and about operations. Um, when the pandemic hit, the logistics of doing that became impossible, so I decided to the uh, guy I was talking to said, well, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, no, I don't know. But I did. So and I go running most every day and uh, et cetera. So I would dictate stuff as I'm running. So there's a lot of panting in my, uh, <laughs> 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 you know. But at any rate, the, uh, it's interesting that entrepreneurship has kind of come a little bit full circle from where it was you know, widely disparaged uh, to now they're, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs are rock stars. So um, there is a, there's a median reality uh, that I wanted to try to portray. And in essentially sh kind of shooting down Shark Tank, that that is absolutely not how any venture capital firm works. Uh, the thought that people would make a decision <laughs> on, uh, you know, on on a 10-minute elevator pitch, um, the idea that you can get people bidding against each other is just couldn't be further from the truth. I would say the fastest we ever moved on any deal was 90 days. Um, and there's a reason for that. If you, you get into a deal and you say, whoops, which you can do if you've got a public... Um, if you're trading in public stocks, you have a whoops, you just go sell it. This one, you're in it. You're in it for five years. Uh, you're there. You better make the thing work. So, I mean, there, is, there isn't anything we don't do. Uh, if, we can in, if we can interview your kindergarten teacher, we'll do that. Um, to hmm. try to understand everything we can understand prior to doing a deal. Uh, and then, of course, after... Um, what what it appears to most people is uh, that if you just have a great idea and you get funded, you're on the 20-yard line. Um, in my perspective, is it's true you're on the 20, but it's your own 20. Um, you know, there's a long way to go to success. Almost all the successes and failures that we've seen at Domain 
doing some 250 companies come, you know, obviously after we've funded it. We've um, screwed up a good number of them and we've taken some pretty average ideas and uh, they become great companies. So um, that's, that's the thrust of the book is to try to talk a lot more about uh, what the reality is. There are a lot of perceptions on who can become an entrepreneur. You have to be born one, have to go to an Ivy League school. You know, none of this is true. We all heard the story. It's splash even and listen to the bartender there. <laughs> you listen to the story at the winery that we were at in Mexico. Uh, the perception is that people jump into this um, and you can make millions of dollars in a short period of time. I would say entrepreneurship is a, is a great, great, great life. It's not, it's the, one of the hardest ways to make money. Um, yes, there, is, there are some, some real success stories, but those that are driven by the, um, by the concept, the money comes along. Those who are driven by the money just don't make it. And my, my experience is, I, we, I won't back somebody that's saying, you know, we're gonna be able to flip this and get rich quick. So, um, uh, it's, um, it was really fun writing the book. Um, this is a whole new adventure for me. The book is just finished. Um, actually, if you have an interest in it, Barnes and Noble at only once a year does a two day um, thing where they discount books about to be published. Mine won't be published till October 3rd. Uh, there's a 25% discount. Um, that's supposed to be confidential because they don't announce it. <laughs> but if you want, are interested in order it, don't order it tomorrow. <laughs> order it Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> but uh, I have read this book. Uh, I've uh, reviewed drafts with Brian. We've gone back and forth. We've discussed it. Uh, but for those of you that are teaching a course uh, that deals with post-startup, pre-liquidation, pre-IPO, uh, that's the sweet spot of this particular course. Um, the, the, many of the stories and um, many of the lessons and the underlying thinking of those are so germane to a course like that. So um, uh, it's called uh, The Idea is the Easy Part. Uh, it just really fits in the context for those of you that are trying to teach classes um, about managing a growing firm. I also try to demystify the venture capital process, which is mysterious to a lot of people, as to exactly how we look at deals. Um, and what we evaluate and what we don't. And it is interesting to see that a lot of effort is put into areas that really don't do that much good. Um, we see about 1,500 deals a year uh, as a firm and we do 10. Um, so generally speaking, you know, we're not net, uh, we, we certainly do good deals. I mean, we know enough to know that the, it's a good deal. Um, but I think I looked at our data, 54% of our successes, forget our failures, 54% of our successes, they're not practicing the business plan that we were originally presented with. Um, so there's a lot of twists and turns in the road. Um, I've become a much bigger devotee of the jockey than the horse um, because there's a lot to, to, to go through. But I do give a perspective on exactly what it is we do due diligence on, what it is we really care about. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting, some people do great damage with their uh, business plans. Um, I, I try to look through it sometimes, say this is a good idea, it's hopelessly presented, but um, it's, um, it's, it's something, but hopefully um, you, 
you'd at least get a perspective of the way we look at it. I thought maybe I'm alone in this. Uh, there are people with all kinds of different strategies and different looks, but it is interesting. My brother happens to be now was an entrepreneur in the wireless and um, um, cable TV area and is now a venture capitalist. We actually bring him into class mm -hmm. since I do biotech. And I think what we're trying to show to the students is the principles mm -hmm. to startups and running companies is all the same, independent of the technology. It's still all about um, you know, the people and the flexibility. So uh, um, all right. it's been a fun process. Um, what I'd like to do is just open the floor up for some Q&A. We have about 10, 15 minutes if you've got some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, both of you. All right, Brian, uh, if the idea is the easy part, what's not the easy part? What's the yeah. hard part? If you could name one thing, what's the hard part? Um, it's, 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 it really is in operating it and, and showing flexibility to be able to pivot and turn. Um, you know, there's a, a, a the radio show on uh, uh, where the, the question at the end of the podcast um, mm -hmm. on NPR. Like is, yeah, what's your, what, um, is it uh, luck or skill? Yeah, is it luck? Uh, were you lucky or? Uh, and you know, my answer to that would be, yes, it's it's all luck. It, it's all bad luck. I mean, all mm -hmm. tons of bad things happen after you're into it, and to have the flexibility to be able to um, to make changes and move. So it it is exceptional to find somebody that can be truly 100% focused on what the objective is, but then recognizes futility and stops and goes in another direction. So we did Amgen. Amgen's a multi, multi-billion dollar company today. Uh, EPO was the eighth shot at it. Started out as an ag company because they thought it would be too hard to get things through the FDA um, and wound up with a, a really winner drug. But um, the CEO there was a genius. He never diversified. He just did one thing said, it's not going to work, stopped, and changed directions. So. No one went to do that. Other questions? Yeah. Go Hi, ahead. Brian. Um, Alex has told about, talked about this class a lot. Uh, I'm Alex's colleague. I think I sat in your class about 10 years back when I came here for my job interview. Um, mm -hmm. So it's good to see you again. <laughs> uh, uh, my question was regarding uh, the success and failures that you had uh, or you're talking about. Um, what did you take from each one of them and did it improve your ability to identify better opportunities uh, as you went along, like starting off from like your initial deals to the ones that you're doing recently? Now are you able to better spot those things and has your success rate increased uh, if so? What are those intangible elements that you're looking at today? Yeah, when you're looking at the deals today, you mentioned that uh, it's about the person that you look at a lot. Yeah, so what are, what are those intangible elements that you're looking at that would help you identify that this business could work out? Uh, interesting. The more I get into this, the more I see that, uh, you know, desire and commitment to the to the uh, uh, mission is the, one of the most imp important things. Uh, the integrity of the person. I, I used to focus a lot on skills to see if the skill set was there, which I look at now, obviously. Um, but it's not as important as the commitment to, uh, to the process, I think. The other thing is I've really switched around my um, due diligence. If there was a candidate, let's say, to be CEO, uh, I may have talked to their prior employer, their boss, to find out what he was like, 
you know, how good he or she was in that particular job. I now spend almost no time um, with the boss and almost all the time in my due diligence in looking at people with people that work for them, subordinates. Um, because that's really where it is. I've had too many quote unquote suits, people who really look great, know everything there is to know about care and feeding of the boss, but don't do stuff. Um, so you can, you can really tell a lot about people about the way they interface with their subordinates. And I spent a tremendous amount of time on that intangible. Um, it's something that I have been at this for 30, 35 years or so in picking people out, and I'm still no good at it. It is really hard. Um, it's really hard to do. I, I know some stupid things to do, but I still don't know the right things. <laughs> Some other questions? Yes, I have one question here. Yes, I have one question. Go ahead. So, thank you. Um, would you like, please, uh, provide us with three best practices or rationale or justification for uh, for being, that be, that should be used to persuade universities that are still mm -hmm. resisting the idea of co-teaching? Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know better than I okay. I, um, say, I'm going through that process now. I went to undergrad to a liberal arts school that is absolutely anti anything industrial commercial. And um, they're, they're, they've had an entrepreneurship program that they put downtown far away. Uh, and they're now <clears throat> building a middle campus of which entrepreneurship believe it or not, is going to be put together um, with some dancing, art, et cetera, uh, which I think is a great thing. So it's starting to get um, recognition. You know, my argument is you don't have to be one, but it drives America, particularly as I go around the world. This country is driven by entrepreneurship, and it's how we win. Um, and everybody is envious of us. So it's something that students should understand. You don't have to do it, you don't have to like it, but you ought to understand that what's going about. And it's, it has tremendous applicability over the nonprofit area, so. Yeah. But it's, um, well, it's, there's a lot of negativity um, by yeah. the faculty. The I faculty's think, a problem. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that, you know, when you look at it, uh, from our perspective, and that's that's why I wanted to have this fireside chat. Um, you know, I can bring. I mean, I've spent my career in education. I've worked with different companies and so forth, mostly in a in a consulting or an ex exec ed capacities. But really, um, I've been really focused on the academic side of it. And we've developed our frameworks. We've developed our tools, concepts, and techniques, and so forth. Now, I can teach that at a conceptual level, and I can do it with abstract cases, if you will. Um, but I can, I can do it more effectively when I'm working with someone like Brian, because we bring different perspectives to the table. Um, and, and I think when it's done in a thoughtful and, and, and in a purposeful way in terms of coming in, really understanding what the student learning outcomes, the uh, objectives of the course are all about so that we could focus on choosing cases or exercises or other, other um, learning pedagogies that help us better understand or help our students to develop their understanding of the student learning outcomes. Um, and we have found it a very effective way for us to work together in that capacity. It's hard because people consider it anecdotal, but the stories is what kind of, if you've given the lesson, you've gotten the principle across, 
a couple stories makes it sink in. Mm -hmm. Rush? Yeah. Uh, so you've been teaching this for 25 years. Uh, over the course of those 25 years, have you had to make any significant changes to the content based on changes in trends or uh, you know where things are going, either to address technology or the way we invest or the way companies change? You know, um, the underlying structure of our course still remains intact in terms of uh, the underlying fundamentals, uh, but having someone like Brian in the class, um, um, the examples change. The, um, you know, I mean, in terms of what we're able to talk about, and I'll give you an example. Brian, uh, uh, it's, it, we've got a, just a couple of minutes left, but uh, he, he introduces to the class a very, comprehensive case that they're doing in Russia, okay? And, and so we've done that for a number of years, but now when we talk to our students, the question is, what do you do when you're committed to something and there's factors outside of your control how do you get out of it? And so we're talking with Brian about, you know, a particular deal they were doing and they were committed in Russia in a much earlier period and now the environment has changed like that. So even though we tell that story in the class, well, what does that mean for our students? Uh, what we're really talking about is any exogenous factor like that, that once you're committed, when you're committed to a course of action and then something unexpected like the Russia situation today um, changes and so our students have a chance to ask him, he's in the middle of the trenches trying to deal with that and sharing with us in a generic kind of a way, uh, um, you know, some of his underlying thinking. I'm now out of it as of last week. It was not simple. You're out. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Obama and Medvedev, but that Medvedev at the time was president, came to Silicon Valley in uh, 2010, and they were big buddies. And uh, they invited 12 venture capitalists over there. And I was one of them and saw, you know, that this is a great way. The more that you're connected commercially, the more likelihood it's going to be peaceful. Mm -hmm. So, Jeremy? In the time you've taught this class together, I mean, this is a little bit of a take on that, but specifically, uh, diversity has become you know, a greater issue. Yeah. The uh, I mean, uh, demography of students, way more women studying business, et cetera, et cetera. How have you guys incorporated that? In? Well, I mean, um, uh, again, it's uh, the, uh, I think that the underlying managerial factors uh, of running a business, that's what we're really focused on here. But then you have to overlay it with those kinds of issues. Um, uh, it, you, you address it, believe me, we don't ignore it. We, we do address it through um, our current case discussions and, um, um, you know, some of the challenges through the practical projects that the students are working on. Um, I'll do another exercise in that class from a book that I love called um, uh, Lessons from the Edge. And so, uh, in, in a, in a, I, if anybody's familiar with that book, it's vignettes of entrepreneurs that have brought their company to the edge and had to deal with challenges like he just talked about and how to unwind it. Uh, our students do projects uh, around that where they're interviewing entrepreneurs and that's where some of that con the contemporary kind of issues come from. So our students mm -hmm. probe that. Two of, the cases, two of the cases we used have women CEOs, it, and it's an example that I try to use also talking in the, in the book. Um, you know, my, the companies that I have are fairly complex biotech companies, 
And the woman running this company was a high school graduate. She went to become an artist, and she failed as an artist, came close. Um, I found that being good enough is probably the worst thing you can do, or almost good enough, rather. Uh, but she failed as an artist, and she's running a sophisticated biotech company. Another woman, the same thing. So, uh, and th my three partners are women. So to some extent, we we're kind of, have been practicing it all along. Yeah. All right, we got, uh, I have one more question. Go ahead. Thank you guys for taking the time to share your lessons learned. Um, I have a question for Brian. Every, uh, it's been said that every executive, every entrepreneur needs a coach. So just from your vast experience with all these companies from you know, this level that you've had a, a wonderful opportunity to be, to be connected to, what's your go-to in the moment of crisis? Company loses 80% of their business overnight because of COVID. What's your go-to when they're on the phone with you and saying, hey, this is where I'm at. How do I get to that next milestone? I think the idea of do no harm is a good starting point. I don't panic, but no matter how bad the situation gets, I, I really have never panicked. Um, I don't get mad. Um, I, the only thing I ever get mad at is, you know, small things, people saying, why can't I park closer to the building than Joe, because I've been here longer. Then I get mad. But if 80% if of the business goes away, we just got to put our head down, figure it out. And one of the things is total communication, not trying to hide anything, just say, we got a real serious problem here, and we're going to have to figure out how to do it. And that may mean that not all of you are going to be here tomorrow, but I promise you that whatever we do, it's going to be you know, fair and try to help you through any kind of a transition. Um, but here's how we're going to try to get out of it. And, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of a lot of people when they're you put them to the to the task, they they'll get it done. You know, it, right. it, you don't. Yeah. Do, um, I, I have a great uh, comment I use all the time: is the most competent shall decide. And I, when I'm at the top, I say I am the least competent to know, you know, exactly how you fix that manufacturing problem. It's all yours, uh, and but I'm behind you. Mm-hmm for the students to uh, hear about the real life examples through cases. I'm just kind of curious how the cases are being taught because I have like this cases from this gentleman here from USC, the written cases, or I'm just curious how do you like, you know, have the case discussions in class? How was that being conducted? Is it through written formats or they read it before they come in or is it just, they, yeah. They, um, Brian gives us uh, past <laughs> business proposals that that were presented to domain, so we asked the students to evaluate those, evaluate those and uh, then we bring Brian in, so I'll try to tease out of the class the issues. Yeah. And then we'll talk about it, and then Brian comes in, and like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, <laughs> but, uh, but more important than just telling the rest of the story, it's the underlying thinking that that led to the rest of the story. So it's getting to the what you know, every company has really only three or four issues that, that they've got to do. And then the rest is routine. And so many people go through long checklists, which obfuscates really the, the real issues. So we try to get the students to pull out what the real issues are. And then then we actually have a session where they will do due diligence on those on those areas. So for example, with a line, there are four areas that kind of yeah. come out as being issues. Um, it's not easy, but I, I act as like a, a focus group or I'll act as a manufacturer mm -hmm. so they can ask me any questions they want. Um, so that's the having the ability to, you know, when we work together that way to really add some significant richness. Um, before I end, I want to do a shout out to uh, another wonderful friend of mine, Craig Galbraith is here from the University of North Carolina. And he's got a new book out called uh, Humane Entrepreneurship. And um, uh, a sample copy of the book is out on the table out there. And uh, uh, he's got some flyers on it, but um, uh, I'm looking forward to reading that book, Craig. And uh, thank you for coming out. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. <laughs>